Stuart Tato. It's my, uh, as, the, as the chair of Subaru, I must admit, I have virtually absolutely nothing to do with this conference other than look busy, active, and, and of course, uh, energised, which is, comes naturally. But my first job, therefore, is a, a real pleasure to actually thank the Subaru team. Uh, you've seen Claire, Gail and Donovan up here regaled in their finery, um, but of course behind them has been a, a team and is a small organisation that Subaru is, as I keep reminding the Minister. Um, actually, an event like this involves just about everyone. Uh, and, and the fact that they run a darn good session last time and that so many of you chose to come back again, I think, is testament to uh, what bigger room we're going to need next year. Um, so thank them. Also, uh, what is it, a wonderful delight to thank speakers. This is the first time I've ever thanked speakers when all of them have come out of town. <laughs> so uh, they brought the world to Wellington. Uh, so Rob, Christy, Laura, uh, Parakafia, um, Trudy, Jane, Diana, Charles... And Timothy, thank you very much, Namahi, Nahimi uh, Kia I th Thank you all. I guess your examples, your insights and concepts have very much enriched our day, as have, of course, the way that you've actually presented your thoughts um, and related to us personal experiences. Um, we've introduced every speaker. Nearly one has had to introduce their own uh, affiliation um, in some way with a sporting origin place in New Zealand. Mine, I have to admit, is Southern Steel. Uh, just to introduce a bit of gender neutrality um, and also a, a certain Southern bias. Um, normally with Donovan I refer to the Highlanders, but uh, can I say, I, I think one of the interesting things is Kirsty's, Christie's last comment was an interesting one. What problem are we solving? And I was reminded when I worked in the UK, the Blair government came in. It, you know, it was one of the first governments that used the phrase evidence to action. But the first thing they set up were about 20 policy action teams with, that, with the best data that already existed and said, here's the 20-odd problems that we want to change during our term government. And they were issues of neighbourhood renewal, social exclusion, teenage pregnancy, you know, quite a mix of things that you will we'll recognise. But those policy action teams drove an information and an evidence agenda right through for the next decade. For us, I think, in a way, we, we, it's difficult in New Zealand to get a clear agenda. We've got a social investment strategy from ministers, for example, which does give us a strategy. Now, you can interpret that as uh, Richard Seddon would, which is a very strong citizenship model. That was why I introduced an old age pension, so that if you'd worked for the development of New Zealand, you got a pension after you retired. You can take a very narrow fiscal view of it, or you can enrich it. But whatever it is, it's a model that really create, forces us to rethink, in fact, what our information sources are, and I'll come to that later. We're also in a context where I think um, at one stage our previous Prime Minister, Helen Clark, basically told public officials it wasn't their job to think about the priorities for policy. That was ministers' jobs. Strategic. So, in fact, we do have in our wee country a sort of an unease of the politi our political masters to be helped in how they should frame priorities. And that, that poses challenges. And I think sometimes we forget that the first term governments we've had for the last 30 years have always spent the first term telling public officials to bugger off, we've got an agenda. And it's only by the time they get to about the third term that they run out of huff and would like some help in thinking about it. And I think that's <laughs> really, it's quite lousy public sector leadership when we don't think about that as just the way life is and prepare ourselves for the third term right from the day one of after election night. <laughs> so that's, that's... And I think, can I say, I think behind each of these talks was some really important wider framing of policy. Um, from Parakafia came the issue of aspiration. And not only the aspirations of the individuals, but our aspirations for them. And it's, it's the aspirations as a society that we have that makes us think about different groups. Autonomy is very important. How does an individual who goes into a wind's office, for example, feel that their autonomy is being looked after when they can't even find a toilet there? Uh, so autonomy is important. And of course, most importantly with Ron's presentation, the political context. Ron presented a picture, I think, with a, a, a sense rich in evidence, analysis and deliberative capability, uh, something which we would really lust over in New Zealand, but of course difficult to get any decisions. Uh, a sort of a political context that you probably admire us, because um, actually in New Zealand we could make decisions very, very quickly. We're used to turning problems to action, it's getting the evidence in the middle that's for us <laughs> is the big problem. So we are problem to action people, and I think we need to recognise that. Um, in fact, if there were a policy Olympics, 
we would actually be in the 100 metre sprints. We wouldn't have a hell of a lot of people in the marathon. Uh, in fact, if we have anyone, uh, we'd certainly have a few shock putters. Um, but the interesting thing also is when it came to the four, people, four by 100 metre relay, we wouldn't have many people in that because we'd probably drop the baton too often. <laughs> so it's worth thinking about the nature of, of, and we do operate in the political context we have. And that's why it's immensely important for us as New Zealanders to look around the world and to see quite rich experiences, but we also have to place them in the world we are in. And so sometimes for us, it's a bit like waiting, as I did this morning, far too long for the Myringi bus. You've got thoughts, analysis, but you have to wait for the moment when there is a political interest in it. And I think a large part of policy analysis, policy thinking, work by the community, for example, is not actually... I, I think, Christy, you are too ambitious uh, for politicians that, in fact, you know... Often ideas have their day and they come along. I mean, certainly, can I say, in my experience, some of the best analysis we did was using a tax model that we'd had for about five years and then suddenly the government came along intervention in goods and services tax. And we were incredibly well as a country equipped to analyse a tax shift from direct to indirect taxation because we had this model. Now, no one, it was basically underutilised, grossly, until then, but suddenly it came along. And I think that in New Zealand we have to just get used to waiting for, 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 for the idea. And I think that, that balance of problem solving, I think also has to come along with our view of social advancement. And I think one of the things that, that, that I think we need to be richer about is, you know, we produce 60,000 babies a year. We've done it since the late 1940s when my mother produced me. Uh, and, and our demographers say we're going to do that till 2050. Now, what I'm sure my friends from Treasury there would say, what better naturally endowed capital can you have than 60,000 babies? So what the hell are we doing to look after them? And in some ways, one of the things we have to think about as we look about social investment models is what are the metrics we're interested in? Are we really interested in capital stocks? I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean capital, I mean health, education. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm talking about a, a very comprehensive view of capital. And maybe far too much of our... Because income is one of our most important instruments for delivering policy, it's become too significant an instrument for the analysis of the population. Just a, a little thought, and I think that comes through a little bit. I think Paracafia's comments on, on aspirations were immensely Im, 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 important. Do you know that, that, that this year we have, the number of Maori doctors we have uh, in, tra in training is the same as the share of Maori in the population. No indigenous population in the world other than the New Zealand Maori can say that. Now, what next door? I mean, for me as a wee lad, my mother's view of my future success was to be a doctor. So here you've got a whole population that actually can say it's got the same share of the population in training to be doctors as they exist in the population. So, and I think one of the things that we've forgotten is that very much of our analyses of Māori in the 1960s and 70s were based on the administrative records that we had, both from the justice system, the health system, the employment system. And, and, and in fact, so often the social science analyses were two-dimensional cross-tabulations that one might describe as the joy of the pathology of failure, failure from not really very good in analytical work by sometimes dubious social scientists. And I think one of the things that we forgot at that time, and I think we've become a lot better, is to recognise where we've got communities of significance. Then we have to say, if, these were a, if this was a nation of its own self, what would we want to know about it? What would they know about themselves? And it's very clear that it's only in the last few decades, last couple of decades, and I think the Te Kupinga survey, for example, or stats, is an excellent example, where we're starting to shift. And we have to think about that for the, uh, quite an important mix of populations. And I think that came through very, very strongly um, in, 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 in the, the, the comment of Christy, which is that we, have to, we should measure what matters for the people that matter. And I, and I think we, for large populations, parts of the population in New Zealand, we haven't really done that, and I think that's quite an, an important point. Um, Laura highlighted the, the importance of aspirations um, to be not only seen in, in the context of um, the individuals, but in our aspirations for them, and her sense of achievement rather than results, I think, is an important way of defining what we ought to achieve. It's interesting, how do we get better? You might say, what is our ambition? Maybe if it were modest, and as a modest wee lad, it's to be better analytically in the use of the information that we're getting or could share and distill to improve social services. 
And I guess the question there is, can we really encapsulate enough of people's lives in the models and rules that we have? So when we talk about our customers and doing things with them or to them, do we actually really, in the databases we have, have a, a, a sufficient amount of information to understand the natural variability in the population? And I think it's a, a, an important um, qu question that, 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 that we have. I think Christie also challenged, talked about the limitations in the use of markets. And I think it's important, however, to see market thinking in two dimensions. One is, are we on the trading floor, um, looking at the transaction price of a spot market for something? And the second, of course, is a thinking about prices and relative prices. And I suppose a good example of relative prices is the work done by the Auckland City Mission, when um, the study they had pointed out that for many people who, who, who are rock bottom, they would rather go to a loan shark than to a wind's office because the price they had to pay, they thought, in personal autonomy and dignity was just too high to walk in the door. And so when we think about uh, the sort of sense of markets, I think we have to, in the social sector, we have to have a very rich view of what we're actually talking about in terms of price and, what we're, and really, what is the most critical thing, if relative prices are important, we have to have a really deep understanding of the alternatives. And I think that came through very, very much again. And, and, Christy, and of course, both Christy and Trudy commented on the importance of framing analysis as a system uh, and, and th thinking about systems. Just to conclude a bit on data, of course, we had several different views. One, and, and all immensely important, by the way, that wasn't intended to suggest. One is the power of simple analysis from Laura, of actually what you can achieve with really simple counts if you bother to produce them. And I think Russell Wills, in his report as Children's Commissioner, and the Rebstock report on children and young persons, reminded us that actually even very large agencies of state like children and young persons can fail to produce regularly immensely simple and often trivial analyses which can make a huge difference in how you think about the organisation. And I think, to me, one of the sad events of that is it just highlights the fact that really simple ideas like continuous improvement, which seem to be talked about more by the community sector than government at the moment, are actually really quite vital in terms of empowering people in organisations and on the floor. The second side, of course, is the social investment model and broadly thinking about it. Well, actually, is our cross-section data that dominates our thinking really good enough? If we're going to think about the capital in its wider form and changes in capital stocks, then we really need quite rich longitudinal data because we're actually looking at what is the impact of the transactions we have with people that accumulate over a lifetime, not actually on a daily or monthly basis. And I think that one of the perhaps the most important things of the social investment model, whether you like it or not, or whatever political perspective you have on it and how you want to shape it at some stage in the next 50 years, depending on who's running the country, um, it's going to require a really significant rethink in the way we, 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 we actually develop our future in, information sources. We also ought to retain our cynicism. Do you know that, that um, before the Romans arrived in the Middle East, the, when, when there was a, someone needed to be considered to be appropriately given the death penalty, then 23 Jewish judges would get together and they would hear a case. And you know that if they all agreed, they let the person off because there was no way that with any marginal measure of doubt in the evidence that was presented to you could 23 people agree in the same way as something unless the evidence was biased. <laughs> and so I make that point as a poor, simple statistician, that one should always retain just a hint of, of cynicism not cynicism, but really what we're interested in with data and evidence is not only what it tells us, but how much can it tell us because of its quality. And I think that came through in, in many of the talks. And, and, well, just a couple of other things. Laura talked about innovation as an act of discomfort. I actually think it's an act of rebellion. Uh, you know, you've basically got the ordinary people in your organisation saying, actually, our received wisdom is just not up to scratch. And that requires quite courageous people at the top to be told off that they're actually running organisations which are not good enough when they spend most of their life saying that they just crash hot. So I think that that's, that's a really important. And, and, of course, it brings attention and funder contracts. And it also creates attention and political will. Because in a wee country where ministers feel so close to the operations, the last thing they want is public agencies presenting reviews that demonstrate that the work 
which ministers are so proud of, has actually got some quite significant flaws. And I, and I think one of the reflections of that is we've got an amazing variation in New Zealand in the willingness of public agencies to publish results. And I think that's a, that's a, a, a really serious. So just about what about the evidence being valued? Well, you know, in, in the end, um, and Ron, I'm sure you, you all know much better than any of us the work of Carol Weiss. And I like her work because she actually basically says we do overrate the extent to which evidence influences policy. But often its real value is it's the perpetual nature of the sort of intellectual wallpaper that it creates. So that you, whatever you, even if the, in what you produce isn't actually fixing something immediately, it's pervasively around you and forcing you to think and defines the context for everything you do. Um, and I think that, 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 that Ron raised a really important point in the end, which is that the absence of evidence, he gave a good example, but I think it's more general in a little country, that the absence of evidence often means in a country where politicians move quickly is to actually increase sanctions. And so one of the really important roles of evidence is to shift the relationship of the citizen with the state if the natural consequence of a lack of evidence but a need of politicians to do stuff is actually to create yet another sanction on the population. And, and, and I guess one of the interesting things you probably know of the liable parent scheme, a report by the Auditor General recently uh, highlighted the fact that of the total outstanding debt, over 80% of it is actually penalty interest rates charged by inland revenue, not the amount that the actual liable parents own. So if ever we're doing something to keep liable parents out of New Zealand, it's actually the interest rate. And finally, can I say one of the great highlights of the day, and I think for me the most important highlight, which I hope will send you all the way bouncing with your stride, is when a senior Treasury officer, Fiona, made a comment which I interpret as it's better to seek forgiveness than ask permission in her final <laughs> statement. So, well, can I thank you all, thank the team, thank the speakers, thank you all very, very much for coming. Uh, I think it's been a very um, provocative day, an instructive day, and thank you all, um, and wish you all well home. Um, kia ora tata.